been, uh, I've been out there to, uh, to the I don't know that it will be. If it will be, I would tell you, uh, just the impact but that more than the education has on that population, yeah. 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 zero to 60, it's an absolute yeah. game changer. Yeah, it's, it's a great song. Yeah. Hopefully now that these are And she might give it. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Whatever they do. Uh, I, 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 I don't think so. I take that up. I hope so, too. Especially if it's the first child. It doesn't even matter if it's a boy or a girl.
I'm still ashamed to this day. I'm only glad that I realized shortly after and I was able to go help him. Every person has value, even strangers. But what about the people that we really don't like? My next experience is time with the critic. I have an individual here, and our relationship has definitely improved over the last couple months, but they, if I had a, a number one fan, which would probably be my mom, they would be the exact opposite. <laughs> they would be on the bottom of that scale. They wanted to humiliate, humiliate me and, and make me seem small in public, and, and understandably so, and that's okay. But one day, well not one day, this last September through December, for reasons I can't explain now, and I definitely couldn't explain then, I was, I was in a really bad place. I, I was struggling with depression. I didn't want to see anyone or do anything, and, and up until this point, I'd only really told two people after the fact that I had been struggling with it. But I, I wasn't going anywhere. I spent all day either in class or at home by myself in my room alone. And, and obviously you put on a good show for everybody. You don't want people to know exactly what's going on in your personal life, but I was really, really struggling. And so I said, you know, I just gotta get out there. I just gotta go, have a good time. I swear I know that I'll just get over this if I can just get out there. So I go to a party. It was August 30th. No, October 30th, it was right before Halloween. I go to a party. I'm there for about 10 minutes. I get in my car, I go home. No. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this. It was no. I go home at 8:30. At midnight, I get a call from this critic. And I'm still awake. You know, so I'm like, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? You know, not like I had just been crying for the last three hours, but I definitely didn't tell them that. And they asked me if I was okay. I said, yeah, I'm doing just fine, I feel great. And they said, well, I'm sorry, I don't know if this is really awkward or anything. I didn't, didn't mean to interrupt anything you were doing. I just felt like I needed to call you. The last person I would expect in this world to call me and ask if I was doing okay. That was the individual that came to me when I needed the most. I'm not saying that my life got better after that, but I definitely recognize that although this person may not like me, they still saw my value as an individual. They still thought that I was important to some degree to, to make sure I was doing okay. The critic has value, and the people that they criticize have value. My last story is, is titled The Friend. I had a friend in middle school who had no friends. He was quite publicly named the most disliked person in our middle school. And in high school, that's like, okay, I guess, but in middle school, when you're still so insecure and it's just the worst time ever, plus no one likes you, man, this guy just got through the ring of it. And, and I was his friend because I couldn't see anything wrong with him. He was a little annoying, but we're all literally annoying in middle school. Everyone's annoying. So I was like, I mean, there's nothing that wrong with him. So I, I was his friend, and, and he invited me to his birthday party. And it's on the same day that my mom has a big event, and she needs me. But I already decided I was going to go to the birthday party, so I tell my mom, I Mom, I'm going to the birthday party. And anyone who knows Jennifer Stare, Jennifer Percy still knows that she's an absolute angel, and I will preach that to the day I die. And ask my dad, he'll tell you for hours on end, he always does. But this time I felt that she was definitely frustrated, she was flustered that I had made this decision. I think she didn't see it from my perspective, uh, who the individual was, she just thought that I was going to go have a good time with my friends. So I, I asked her, Mom, I need a ride, because I'm in middle school, I can't drive, can I go to this guy's birthday party? She's like, I need you here. How about you just stay instead? I'm like, no, I'm going to his birthday party. I'm sorry that this is upsetting, but I need to go. And she drops me off, and I'm the only one there. Not family, not friends or cousins, nothing. 
she picks me up, and I'm still the only one there. And, you know, she asks, where is everybody else? It's not that he didn't invite other people, it's that no one else showed up. I've always been a popular guy. I've always had lots of friends and people that liked me. And I can't imagine what it would be like to invite all my friends to a party and have none of them show up. Afterwards, she, my mom thanked me for deciding to go. But it was a hard decision. I had to go against my mom and my own family. I mean, I trust her for everything. I call her for everything. Every ounce of advice that I need, I call her. And for me to ignore that and to go anyways, that was a hard decision. Now, I share these experiences because first, I'm pretty young. Most people in here are older than me, and if you're not older than me, you're a lot more mature than I am. So. It's hard for me to, to preach anything or to say anything and have it hold any value if I don't share experiences that I've already gone through myself personally to give me a basis, a foundation for why I believe these things. But I truly, truly believe that every person in this room and every person that I've ever met has value. I don't doubt that. If we spend our lives dedicated to serving those around us, we will see that value continually. To start to doubt it less and less and believe it more and more in the strangers, whether they have blood on their face or not, in the critics, the ones that hate you the most, the people that love you the most, your friends, even when it causes conflicts with other people, Every single person in this room has value. It's intrinsic. You're born with it. But you can add on it. You can add on your own. You can add on others. My last little bit is a challenge. I'm Mr. Cat, professor here. If you guys haven't taken Sociology 101, please do. It is a really, really good class for whatever your major is. He issues a challenge, and I'm gonna issue that same challenge to each of us today. I think we all think that we're pretty benevolent people, benevolent meaning, like, giving. But his challenge really made me realize that it wasn't. You have to mark down how you serve someone that day, every night, in a little journal. And I was surprised how many zeros I had, a lot of zeros. And when I started to catch on how many zeros I had, I started serving more people, but is that really a good motivation, an assignment, you know? Am I, I'm only helping people because I don't want to see that zero at the end of the day. It really made me analyze and reflect on what am I doing because I want to do it, and what am I doing because it's convenient. Tomorrow is the start of April, it's April 1st. I should just challenge to everyone. You do it for a month or a week, I think the week's the minimum, but at least see, see where you lie. Are you really that giving? Are we really that benevolent? Do we really try and help those around us? Or is it just when it's convenient? I promise that you'll see things about yourself in a life that you hadn't seen them before. And I know that from experience. Thank you.
dia, tudo bem? Estou muito feliz de estar aqui falando com vocês. Tenho muitas coisas para dizer e, e se vocês fazem algumas coisas que eu lhes falo, vão ter, vão ter uma, uma diferença imediatamente nas, na comunicação que vocês têm com as pessoas na sua vida. Então, vamos lá. Ok, o que eu disse? Who else understood? Yes. Oh, you want to say something? Oh, you want to say something? Yes. About Mary. Any specific things that you want to say? What was I speaking? Portuguese. Portuguese. Okay. And why didn't everyone understand that? No one's learned it, right? I'm assuming. So uh, when we don't know things, it's, it's hard to uh, do them. Today, I'm hoping to uh, give you a little bit of things, a, a little tool that might help you out. And there are things that you already see, but sometimes we don't really know what we know. And so the, these are tools that I'm gonna try and pass on to you. And uh, this is about understanding. Uh, just like you, it's hard to understand something if you don't know it, if you're not familiar with it, if you haven't learned it. Understanding is a big key part of our lives. So we went from what do we do as an individual, and uh, I appreciate Porter for his uh, vulnerability and his, his ability to tell these stories that, that uh, are very impactful. I can see that in him, and it's, it makes a difference in my life. Well, um, my perspective is going to be a little different. And so my goal is to talk about how do I improve the relationships that I have with those around me. And that could be family and friends. Um, so we go from us individually to how do I reach out to those around me and how do I have better relationships. And I work a lot with people uh, in counseling, but I, I want to uh, give you a little different perspective. I also work with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and I really like working there. I work with the inmates, and I do uh, drug treatment there. But I also have collateral duties. One of the things that I really like doing is uh, hostage negotiation. So I'm on the hostage negotiation training. To, I'm the, one of the trainers for our national uh, cadre that trains all of our teams. And so, If you think about hostage negotiation, what comes to mind? What do you think about? We see the movies, right? And you see intense, you know, they go in and let me talk to the hostage taker and all that stuff. Well, the real life thing, there are things that happen. So let's say there's a hostage situation. There's high emotion, there's danger, There are high stakes. How do you get a person who is taking hostages, how do you get them to let go of the people they, they have as hostages, give up their weapons, and come out and give themselves up, knowing that there are going to be good consequences? And so that's the trick. What I'm going to show you today is one of the tools that we use. And the reason I want to do that is because these tools are things that I started to realize that once I started working on the team. I've been on this team for probably about 14 years. And so um, one of the things I want to pass on to you is what's called the FBI. This is a thing that, that was developed by the FBI. It's called the stair Stairway to Behavioral Change. If we want to get someone to do something, we want to influence them or change their behavior, it's important for them to be able to trust us. Otherwise, Why would they change? And so this stairway, it has to do with when time passes, there are certain things that we want to do. And it has to be in this order or it's not as effective. So you have 
just briefly, uh, it starts with active listening skills. We need to be able to listen and show people that we're listening, that we're paying attention, that they are important to us, that, that what they're saying is valuable, and more importantly, what they feel is valid. It doesn't matter if you agree with someone or not, what they feel is valid, always. And that's the thing that we want to zone in on. You want to make sure that you're using empathy. Uh, empathy being the, the, the ability to feel what someone else is feeling, to know that that what they uh, what they're feeling uh, that you can associate or relate to that, and it goes to rapport. Once you have developed, once you've used these listening skills and developed or used empathy, you develop rapport, which is when the other person now is relating to you. They understand you. You feel like you're on the same page. Uh, you relate to each other. I don't know if you guys if, if You've had that experience where you're sitting with someone and almost immediately you start to feel like, oh yeah, we're, we're kind of the same. And that's rapport. From there, then you have the ability to have some influence over this person. Because the person trusts you. And then the last one is behavioral change. That's when a person trusts me, then I'm able to suggest, hey, why don't you uh, consider letting those people Let's talk about what are the next steps? What can we do next? And so it takes some time, it takes effort, but all of it has to do with communication. The things that we see in the movies are a little bit exaggerated. I'm sure that's a surprise to you, right? <laughs> but uh, they're a little bit exaggerated. The, it's, it's not as um, uh, crucial as you see it. It, it is, there, there are life-threatening situations situations. But the, the thing that surprised me is the tool, the main tool that we use is communication, empathy. And if you want to call it what it really is, uh, you, your ability to love people. And so I'm going to show you our core communication skills, listening skills that we use. These are things that, that we use constantly, and these are the core ones. There are others that we use, but I want to focus on these because I'm going to show you one skill, and we're going to try to practice these things before you leave, so you have something that you can go away with. Um, and you can use it today, and I'm telling you, uh, as you use it, you're going to notice the difference in your relationships almost immediately. Uh, so you have summarizing and paraphrasing. I'm sure you guys have heard those before. When you summarize something, you're, you're kind of wrapping it up. You're, you're getting the whole gist of it. You're also pointing out what maybe the person is feeling, what they're going through, what their thoughts were. Um, paraphrasing is similar to that, but you're doing it in shorter gaps. So if someone says one or two sentences, you, when you summarize, you just summarize that little bit of it. Um, mirroring is you're getting the gist of things. Sometimes you can use that as a one or two word thing. You, you get one or two words of what they're saying and repeat it back to them and it, it helps them continue to talk. The one that we're going to focus on today is called uh, emotional labeling. Emotional labeling is when you see an emotion that you're able to identify that emotion and, and tell the person what you identify noticing. And it sounds kind of uh, like, oh yeah, that's logical, but we don't often do this. We don't really tell people what we think that they're feeling. We tell them how we're feeling. We tell them what we want, but we don't tell them how we think they're feeling. And by doing that, when we do that, it helps them to know that you're listening to them. It helps them to know that at a deeper level you understand what they're going through. And that's how you build that rapport. So, emotional labeling is when you see an emotion, you label, you put a label on it, and you say it to the person. Well, it sounds like, or it feels like, or it seems like you're feeling this way. Now, uh, does anyone know what this is? It's an emotion wheel. Okay, good, an emotion wheel. Uh, now, if you just were to look at it, for all the artists out here, what does this look like? It's the color wheel. Same thing, 
right? The color wheel, if you look at it, has the four, it has the basic colors as the primary colors. Uh, I said four, it's really three, right? Am I getting that right? Uh, primary colors, when you mix with other primary colors, make secondary and tertiary colors. And each color has its own shade and its own name and all that stuff, right? When it comes to emotions, we're used to using very basic descriptors. Like, what are the things that when we talk about emotions, what do you usually think about? I'm mad. Mad is one of the most popular, right? Sad. Sad. Happy. Happy. So those are basic emotions, right? And, but the, the thing is that just like there's many colors on that color wheel, there's also very many emotions. There's a lot more accurate way to describe how we think someone's feeling and how to describe what we're going through. So being able to be more accurate in our description of those emotions, it makes it to where the person really understands that we know what they're going through. So think about, if we think about the word happy, for example, happy is a descriptor of an emotion. But there's a big difference between content and ecstatic. Big difference, right? But both of those are kind of happy emotions. So if we can be more accurate and in describing the thing that we see someone going through, it helps them to know that we really know what they're going through, that we're, we're, we're right there on the same page with them. And, um, and it helps us to know that we're on the right page. Because part of us listening is, is knowing that, that, uh, that I'm picking up on the things that the, the other person is putting out there. So, when you see it, label it, okay? Let me tell you, there, there's shortcuts to this. And the shortcut, or the hack, or whatever you want to call it, to be able to remember how to do this, is you remember these phrases that are here on the left. What well, seems like you're feeling this way, or it sounds like this is what you're going through, or you know, um, you say you're not mad, but it kind of looks like you're mad. Um, it looks like you're going through something really serious right now. So there, there are a lot of ways to do this, and you don't have to use these words every time as long as uh, you remember, if you get stuck, use the phrase and it helps your brain to start kicking in a gear to think about what does it seem like or what does it look like what does it sound like um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to try and fix the problem you don't want to uh, dismiss make excuses for the person or dismiss what they're saying I see a lot of people saying things like well uh, don't cry uh, don't, you don't need to feel that way don't, don't tell them not to feel the way they're feeling. Uh, it invalidates the thing that they're going through. Um, and don't worry about making mistakes. The good thing about this is when you make a mistake, the person usually will correct you. And the effort shows them that you're trying to listen to them. So making mistakes is not a bad thing. Don't be afraid of it. So we're gonna practice a little bit now that you guys are uh, emotional labeling experts. We're gonna try and do this. It's Carla's birthday, she's having a party today. All of her friends are coming. How would you guys label this emotion? Or these emotions? Giddy? Ecstatic? Excited? <coughs> Jubilant. I like that, good. So see, there's a lot of ways to describe this. Would any of you pick up that maybe she's feeling a little bit anxious or nervous? Right? Yeah, nervous, anxious. Because uh, what if they don't show up? Or what if uh, it doesn't go the way I expect? So there's a lot of different emotions. And when it comes to emotions, it can be complex because you can feel multiple emotions at the same time. So even though you might be, you might get one or two right, there might be others too. So keep that in mind. All right, here's number two. Tom just got a new phone. As he pulls it out of the box, it falls and the screen cracks. 
I, I saw some grimaces already. Some of you have experienced this before, right? How might you be feeling? Frustrated. Let's get a little more accurate. Frustrated is a good word, but sometimes it's a little overused. Angry. Cheated. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? What's that? Miffed. Yeah, I like that. Good. So there are uh, there are a lot of ways to describe this stuff. And that's the point. You want to try and get as accurate as you can. I know you guys can't relate to this one, right? Final exams have started and Jim has been studying most of the night. He still has two subjects to go. How is he feeling? Wiped out. Exhausted. Burned out. Hopeless. Yeah. Maybe worried. So there, there's a lot of ways to describe this. Okay, I think I have two more. Jenny just found out her younger sister is involved in a car accident. Her sister is in surgery. How would you talk to her? What would you say? When the hard emotions come out, it's a little harder, isn't it? Pensive. You look thoughtful, pensive. Good. Worried. Worried, for sure. Obsessed. Yeah. What's that? Obsessed. Obsessed? Yeah. It's so, understandable. Of course, you're thinking about all the bad stuff that might be happening, right? Yeah. So um, even the hard emotions, there's a lot of descriptive words for that. And when we use those, it helps people to open up. It helps them to know that we are there for them uh, and we're there. Last one. Joel had an interview at, at a prestigious firm and seemed to really hit it off with the boss at the interview. He has worked for this job for three years. What is he going through? It seems like, it feels like, it looks like. Anxious. Anxious? Okay. Confident. Confident. You see the confidence there, right? Hopeful. Hopeful. There you go. Sometimes we think until we make it, right? So there's a lot of ways to describe this stuff. And I'm telling you, this seems like a very simple technique. And even if you were to use it, um, not quite knowing what to do, it might seem mechanical at first. It might seem like you're just kind of going through the motions. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It might seem like that to you, but to another person who's on the other side of it, they're going to feel like you're really being attentive, like you're really listening, like you understand them. That's the goal. Connecting with others, it takes a certain number of skills. And unfortunately, I think we've gotten away from being able to really truly listen and have conversations with other people. Um, I like these little faces because um, it's easy to pick out, how am I feeling today? What am I going through? Now, if you, if you look at people, we're really good at uh, even when you're texting and doing things like that, posting on social media, you're, you put emojis by it. If you can look at people and see what it is they're feeling, if you were to put an emoji by, by what you see them going through, how would you describe it? And sometimes people have an easier time with that. If you just think about it in terms of emojis, then it's easier to look at, right? Or easier to come up with something. So, let's go back to now that you know some of the things that will help you connect with others, it's almost like you learn a new language. When you pay attention, when you watch people, and when, you are, when you're able to label the things that they're going through, you're gonna see your relationships transform. You're gonna see that instead of bickering and fighting, it's gonna be a little bit more uh, understanding. People do things for good reasons. We just don't understand what their good reason is. And sometimes we get stuck in our stuff <coughs> instead of trying to reach out and listen and pay attention to, to what they're going through. So I would challenge you to, to try and practice labeling. Not labeling in a bad way, but put a label on it when you see it. Tell the person what you think they're going through. And you're gonna see them open up, you're gonna see 
them connect with you. And that's my challenge to you. Thanks for your time.
is to raise funds for the Make a Difference Scholarship. The scholarship will be available for application in July of 2022 and will be open to any high school senior planning to attend college or college student or a college student who will continue their education and who are making a difference in their community. That will be the key for that scholarship. I started these things to survive and pull myself through the darkness. I continue these things to help others through their darkness. We can't always control what will happen to us, but we can control how we will, res how we will respond to it. We can control the controllables and find the controllables. Being a productive member of the community doesn't require a devastating life event or any grand gestures. Most of the time it's small and simple steps with a group of individuals coming together to accomplish the same goals. Community is where you are right now. Being a part of community is an action to make a difference. Each of us can decide right here and right now that we want to be a productive member of this community. I'm going to share with you three things that will help you lead in that direction. First, is joining club or organization. This is for the students, but this is for community members as well. There's plenty of club or organizations that community members can join. But for our students, those you guys are the ones I'm focusing on today. Did you know that EAC has over 30 recognized clubs on campus? 21 which are currently active, and the rest need to become active. Here's just a few of them. And here's a few more. We have clubs in fine arts, religion, academic, diversity, athletics, residence hall, business, and service. Is there a social issue or a focus you're interested in? If there is, joining a club or organization is the best way to address that issue and move forward with your efforts. Never question that a small group or thoughtful committed humans can change the world. Our past tells us it is the only thing that can change the world. Second, is volunteer. Currently, we're signing up for Amer uh, the American Red Cross Blood Drive, which is next Thursday. We're about 75 people short of our goal for the signatures. We really need some extra help. If you haven't had a chance to sign up for the blood drive, please do so when we're done. All of them will be out in the lobby. And I, I promise you, I've donated 52 times, and it doesn't hurt. <laughs> I mean, it does, but it doesn't. <laughs> Does that make any sense? You're supposed to feel better after. Okay, our neighbor's pantry is a food pantry here that covers the Gila Valley. And what they basically do is they have these gardens and they have uh, all these non-perishable food items as well, and they give them to the community members. Well, they're one of our outreach programs that helps us at the Monster Exchange and helps provide food at the Monster Exchange. The thing that they're asking for people to do up until, I think it's April 22nd, is to help them clear out the fields so that they can plant their produce and get things going there. So if you are available and want to help, they, our neighbor's pantry is a local organization that could definitely use help. The other one is the Lions Club. The Lions Club has the produce on wheels without waste. They are also one of our main distributor suppliers for produce for our student organization of the Monster Exchange. Southeastern Arizona Clean and Beautiful is another organization. They organize area cleanups and they help make Southeastern Arizona, clean and beautiful. We also have a justserve.org. You type in your area code or your zip code, it'll give you a whole list of opportunities in this area. The other thing is this, oh, that is great. I'm about to dry up right here. <laughs> Assisting teachers at elementary school by reading to kids, teaching an art project, and helping with PE opportunities. I think that through COVID, we kind of forgot about that opportunity. And we decided that I mean, we weren't supposed to go near those kids, we're supposed to wear masks, we're doing, we're supposed to do all these things. The schools are open to it now, and it's okay to sign up for that. And it's an amazing project. Um, you will, you'll need to contact the administrator of the school to do that. We also have the local foundation families fighting cancer together. They have a basketball tournament last semester. That's something that you can sign up either to participate in or to help with. They always need help. The Families Child and Cancer Foundation. The 5K goal run or the 5K color run was sponsored by them. They need participation. They need people to help with it as well. The Boys and Girls Club, assisting with after school programs, officiating youth sports, because I think everybody should be an official one time in their life. So they can get yelled at. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> or simply reaching out to friends and neighbors that might need your help. Uh, my parents lived across the street over here for about a year and a half. 
And the one thing my dad said that was his favorite thing about living there was the EAC college students that would walk by his house and say, hey, how's it going? Thank you, Charlene. Charlene saves me in a lot of counts. But just the simple hello to the elderly people is such a big deal. They just love it. And number three, participate in campus community events and activities. Things like fine arts events, athletic events, community events, and most importantly in my world is EAC student activities. That's my thing. And we have 10 activities between now and the end of the semester. And here they are. The other way that you can find out students is how you can find out if you aren't already signed up for our text alerts. Take a picture of this screen. Sign up for text alerts. Just text subscribe to that number and I will send you all kinds of text alerts, I promise. Sometimes probably too many. Participating in activities allows us to meet new people, develop friendships, and become community minded. There you have it. Oops, I just went too fast. Let's go backwards. There you have it. The three things that you can do in this, to help become a better part of the community. You can join a club or organization, volunteer, or participate. All three of these help you become better engaged in your community campus and allows for more collaboration and better outcomes for all. Engaging in your community gives you, gives you more purpose and meaning to your life and to the lives of those you serve. Now I want to talk a little bit about kindergarten etiquette in conclusion here. This is my favorite thing. Kindergarten, the first day of kindergarten is a social disaster. Actually, probably the first till October is a social disaster. And it's because that little human was the central focus of their parents' world. And now they're thrown into an area where everybody was the central focus of their world. And they don't understand why they can't do whatever they want to do. So there comes the list, right? You know that list that comes out and it says, uh, don't throw dirt, don't throw sand. I don't know why you have to say both, but you do. Take turns, don't pick your nose. Play nice, that's not yours. Don't take others' things. Listen, say you're sorry, forgive, Use a Kleenex. <laughs> Cover your mouth when you sneeze or cough. How many times have we heard that lately? But we should be doing that anyway. A nap followed by milk and cookies makes everything better. Wash your hands, help others, hold hands and stick together. Kindergarten is, I forgot to push the button, I did that. No, I didn't. Kindergarten is when we didn't care about others. Political beliefs, religion, race, gender, and so many other issues dividing us now. It is where we were safe, accepted, and we began our social and community involvement. Some, somewhere along the way, some developed and expounded on their kindergarten etiquette, some deviated from it, and some forgot about it. If we could all remember what we were taught in kindergarten and how we felt laughing, smiling, and playing nice with others, and not caring about differences, we could shift this world in a better direction. We all need to get back to holding hands, sticking together, and helping others. Oh, and cold milk and warm cookies will definitely help too. Thank you very much. I wanted to do that as quickly as I could because I didn't want to take much more of your time, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. And if you need any more information, students especially need any more information on volunteering or being a part of the community project, please come see me. My office is down the hallway here in the student life area. And if you need information on the activities, because we love you all, you students, to come to the activities, out on the wall, there's a plethora of flyers all over. So please read those and participate and get out of your comfort zone and come participate with us. And thank you. Have a great day. Thank you all for coming. Have a